and welcome to episode 11 of OSW Playlist, an exclusive roundup of what your boy, the swagger, soaring eagle, Jay Under. Nice. And joined today by, oh my god, our own gobbledygooker, V1. <laughs> <laughs> That's right, yes, V1 joining me on this very special OSW Playlist, where he will review a book, and I shall review a video game. It'll be more of a string of consciousness with looser editing, the deal being that I have to get the video recorded, edited and uploaded all one day so it doesn't interfere with OSW scheduling. It's supposed to be 10-15 minutes long when we're done, but we'll see when we finish. So let's get to it! Grammar that is. No way, hold up. No. Cut that. <laughs> <laughs> First up is Faith. An indie horror game by Eredorf Games for the PC. Released October 4th, 2017. Um, you've never seen something quite this indie. <laughs> oh my, I don't know how to take that. By the way, I was just waiting for a second word in the title. When you went Faith, I was going to be... The next word's Breaker, isn't it? It's Breaker, <laughs> isn't it? I was thinking Faith, Family, <laughs> Freedom. <laughs> oh my god. Um, it is an MS-DOS-inspired game, uh, like super retro, like a ZX Spectrum game. Free to play, or you can buy it and name your price. Um, mm, and I like you, that. Yeah, and if you do that, it comes with icons, wallpapers, and the soundtrack. Oh, and that's like inverted commas soundtrack, because it's this like Atari SAP style OST. Bleeps and bloops. Bleeps and bloops. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And again, there are some people who've done wonders with bleeps and bloops, you know? It was, it was that game Thomas Was Alone with, uh, with the shapes. That's a wonderful soundtrack. Beautiful. Oh, that's way more than just... No, I'm talking... Like make a central bleeps and bloops. That is on an Atari. Okay. That's what it's on. Okay. Like. Which is no bad thing. I'm telling you. Uh, anyway, I'll get into it. What's the vig? The storyline in inverted commas. Um, you are Father John Ward, traveling through a disoriented forest of randomized trees and rocks. You searching play a priest? Yes. Repair your little hole. <laughs> that comes into No, it doesn't. <gasps> oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> traveling through a disorienting forest of randomized trees and rocks, searching for the Martin home, tucked deep into the woods, Ward carries with him a crucifix, which can be used to dispel whatever evil lurks beyond the trees. Oh, that synopsis, it's so generous. Uh, actually, here, let, let's, uh, I'll just, you know, it'll make more sense if I'm just showing it. Yeah! Yeah! <laughs> it's like Granny's Garden or something like that. Hey, you like that? Not bad, you know, I, honestly, I pictured it being something worse. Yeah, it's grand. Ah, Chaos Reigns, have a listen. Is he uh, Roman's cousin? <laughs> uh, gameplay is moving your priest around and one action button, which is brandishing your crucifix. I got the cock. <laughs> <laughs> I say priest, but I really mean about 20 blue pixels, and there's one white pixel that represents the color. Nice. It's so rudimentary, your imagination actually takes over and you're able to discern what this stuff is. It's actually quite cool. So your mind fills in all the gaps. Just like it was in the 80s, you know? Combat, which is a generous term, <laughs> boils down to a quick time event where you're walking into different screens and you're in a forest. This kind of scuttling spider demon will come at you from one of the four sides. It's actually successfully creepy because they have this weird synthesized voice and it just goes at you and it freaks you the fuck out. <laughs> Does it come out at random times, or is it set to a certain point in a game? It's random, so... Mm, so it kind of builds up dread of what, when it's going to come out. Yeah, yeah, and it's really annoying, because sometimes if you're actually... Because you want to go to the centre of the screen and wait for it a bit, because if you go towards the end of the screen and he comes out of the end, you're fucked, and you're you fucked. die. Okay. And then you get... It's just a death screen, and it goes, Mortis! Mortis! It's nice. pretty cool. Ah, it was a pretty cool-looking wrestler also. <laughs> So you're walking through the forest and a big spider comes at you. Like, that's straight out of Ski Free from 1991. I was thinking that exact same thing. Where the Yatta! 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 Yeah, it's very much like that. Actually, it does get frustrating because you need lightning reflexes sometimes. And the game itself is like 
pattern recognition and a QTE. The gimmick is that you have to find a key to get to a house and perform an exorcism on a girl. Okay. And fight the demon, recognize her patterns, dodge her attacks and stuff like that. So if you were good at QT and you have fast reflexes, if you knew what you were doing, this game is 10 minutes long. Okay. And if you don't, if you're me, two hours. <laughs> <laughs> Some cool things to note, since it's so basic, you know, this ZX Spectrum looking thing, when little effects are made, it has a huge impact. Like you go into the house, there's some faucets and, you know, a leak in the roof and you can see the water drip down and it's like, oh, look at that, a nice bit of animation. It's like, what am I doing marveling at a fucking blue pixel going down, you know? There's also a mirror spot in it where you... <laughs> You know, you're in the house, you explore the house, and you can see your character in the mirror, or just part of it, and it's like, oh my god, you know? I shouldn't be marking out over that. Um, Hold we, on, always mark out over mirror spots. Yeah. We do get some cool warping pixel, kind of very short cutscenes. It's rotoscoping, so they're like outline of animation, but with pixels, and it's like, she is here, rah, rah, and it's a whole, you know, you really appreciate that. And since I was telling you it's kind of one hit dead, every time you reach a little cutscene, it just rewinds to there. Okay, that's fine. So basically, it doesn't force you back to the beginning of the game every time you die. Yeah, yeah, because that, right. that would be a killer. Yeah, that's like go away heat, you mm -hmm. know? Exposition is almost completely done by picking up notes. They're carelessly strewn about the gaff, and you can kind of exercise a tree and that'll release a note, you know? I love video game logic where exercising a tree will give you uh, plot points in a game. <laughs> it's beautiful. So there is a bit of uh, hoopla about Catholic and pagan religion and there's a the evil demon at San La Muerte. Another cool bit is like uh, you're going through the house and it's like, oh, you're going to the bathroom. It's like, oh, there's a the toilet. You can banish some demons. <laughs> um... <laughs> You know, towards the end of, like, the game is very short, but, like, you get a shotgun and it goes into, okay, this is the final bit, so there are five different endings you can get. So you get the shotgun, as soon as you get, boom, because you want to try it out, and it's like, that's it. <laughs> but if you leave the house and go back, they'll actually give you another one, thankfully. Okay, yeah, yeah. okay. I don't know if you're going to play it, but let's go through the five endings real quick. Okay, one of them, the demon possessed the girl and ends up ex straight out of the exorcist, you know, throws herself. One, she's so kind to say throw herself out. The pixels stop happening on screen and they have a little broken window <laughs> where the pixels used to be. She threw herself out of the window, so you get the shotgun and shoot her. You get in your car and you leave, you get pulled over by the cops and you just say, oh, you're a murderer. You know, you killed some woman, she's dead, and you killed her. I said, oh, she escaped from a mental institute. Like, and that was cool, there's one of okay. five endings. There's another one, oh, it's brilliant. You get the gun, and then instead of shooting her, you shoot a deer. Go into your car, and you drive. There's a lot of deer in the road. You swerve, and you smash into a tree. So it's like, ring. Yes. <laughs> and you're kind of struggling in, along the ground. There's just a load of deer around you, and one of them charges in and murders you. Holy shit. Awesome. Fucking grim. Yeah. And um, there's another one where you see a different house. It's just this being dressed in black, and you shoot him. It turns out that that was the other priest that had come to sort it out, and uh, he was actually trying to exercise a different kid, and the kid is in the back of your car in Pearl Harbor's you. Where to, Stephanie? <laughs> And there's another one where you just see there's an animal sacrifice on the ground. Chaos reigns. You can shoot that and you get in your car and then you're kind of stopped by people in red hoods. They kind of sacrifice you. So fuck. So that's four for four pretty grim endings. Oh, the best one, Steve, <laughs> is you don't shoot anything and you go with your car with the gun. And then just before you get in the car, the spider demon from the woods comes at you and you shoot him. And then he kind of stumbles off, and then he gets run over. Okay. And then you get in your car and leave. All of the endings have a newspaper headline, which you read afterwards. And it's like, yeah, there's uh, some weird animal that people are calling a chupacabra. They can't recognize what this animal was, but they found a carcass on the road. Spider baby. There, there we go. 
go. Um, and so that's it. So if this does interest you, give it a go. It is free, or you can throw him a couple of bucks if you want. So shout out to Steve Live Tweets. He got me into this game. I got it off itch.io. Yeah, thumbs up. <laughs> game with inverted commas. You know what? This game actually sounds like a bit of crack. I personally like games like this. Uh, I am a big fan of like David Cage's games. Not so much a fan of his writing, <laughs> but I... Or him as a person. <laughs> or him, yeah. But I do like that, you know... Trying to think of other games with QTs that I like. Um, Heavy Rain. uh, Yeah, like Heavy Rain, Beyond Two Souls. No, actually, Beyond Two Souls is terrible. (laughs) That's David Cage's worst game. But like Fahrenheit, Shenmue, uh, a big, big fan of that. Resi 4 had all of the QTs, Mm -hmm. um, which lots of people hated. Uh, I was always a big fan of them. So yeah, uh, I would be down with playing something like this. Actually, you're never going to play a game that looks like a ZX Spectrum game as well, so... I don't know, you know? The, there's a lot yeah. of indie games coming back and they, you know, some of them look rough, but that's just part of their charm, you know? Uh, I'm currently playing Celeste. Oh, uh, Whopper soundtrack. It, the soundtrack's stunning, but the gameplay is lots of fun, and I love pixel art like i know people who just will not play a game that's pixel art based and i'm playing this going this is gorgeous like this is beautiful so yeah uh, i'd absolutely recommend it it's a lovely little ditty of a game uh what type of game is it uh celeste is a 2d platform game it'd be something along the the ilk of a super meat boy like oh okay crushingly difficult platformer platform game where each room is really difficult and there are some where you'll be the first time there are others where you might die 50 times but then when you finally beat it you feel like a boss and then you go on to the next screen and die 50 more times amazing soundtrack beautiful looking a decent little plot seems to be kind of based around mental health uh, oh. It's got a nice few little moments in it. Like, my character was having a panic attack, and one of her friends told her, uh, he was like, every time where I feel like this, I always shut my eyes. I think of a leaf that's falling, and then you have to time your uh, button presses, which act as your breath, because the gimmick is to keep the leaf in a certain box, and you keep doing that for about 40 seconds until your character slowly calms down. Oh, that's lovely. I'm like, that's really sweet, really nice touch. Absolutely recommend it. Although it's crushingly difficult. (laughs) Fuck that wind level. The wind, the wavy trees, Jay. (laughs) They won't let me away with it. Wait, so it raises your blood pressure and then another section lowers it. And and then brings you back down again. And there was also a mirror spot. Oh my God. With so... The two games in a row with <laughs> mirror spots. So yeah, Celeste is lovely. I really, really like it. You recommend? Absolutely. There we go. Two for the price of one reviews there. Mm. The thing is, that we're, uh, this this stopped being a wrestling company years ago and became an entertainment company. Vince wants to always be ahead of the curve. Uh, one of the first things on television was professional wrestling. Aha, side B of OSW Playlist, which is review of Creating the Mania, an inside look at how WrestleMania comes to life. Now, this is a 320-page book giving you a behind-the-scenes look of WrestleMania 34, OSW 71, and the year leading up to it, featuring a bit of background ska and divvying up the individual journeys of the wrestlers on the card, along with interviews of said wrestlers. Now, this book, written by John Robinson, who also penned WWE books, The Ultimate Warrior, A Life Lived Forever. Oh, that's factually incorrect. He's dead. <gasps> Can you just say... <laughs> <laughs> I'm happy to leave that. No, that's fine. NXT, The Future Is Now. Or the future is now. No. And WWE, the Attitude Era. Which it wasn't. 
the attitude error was dead by the time they cha- name changed. Uh, thank you for pointing that out. That's something I'm going to get into in this book, by the way. Oh my god. Published by ECW Press. No relation, incredibly. How the fuck can a publishing company who publishes wrestling books get away with calling themselves ECW? I think they might be... They've been in business since before WWE owned ECW anyway. But it's so weird. It like, is weird. You put out wrestling books and you're called ECW. It's just, it's just bizarre. Because if you go along the keys in Dublin, <laughs> you will see the sign ECW Press. It's like, yeah. holy shit. Awesome. What a great fit, you know. Massive thanks to Caroline from ECW Press for hooking us up with some extra copies to give away to you, fine folks. That sounds sarcastic. Yeah. Uh, competition details after the I review. Won more than you thought you had. <laughs> <laughs> Creating the Mania, a huge roller coaster of a novel in 400 sizzling chapters. A searing, meaty piece about wrestling in the 21st century with some hot gypsies thrown in. <laughs> Let's do it to it. For two weeks, we've had an average of 400 people a day. We're using uh, over 150 semis. We're hanging over half a million pounds. We're using 13 trucks just full of video. Mr. V. Wunser, what did you think of creating the Mania? Technically, Mania was created. You know, WrestleMania was. Um, a Mania amongst the fans? No, not particularly. A Mania amongst the readers? No, not particularly. <laughs> um, look, if you have been following the wrestling business, listening to wrestling podcasts and reading dirt sheets, or have read multiple other wrestling books in your life, then there's literally nothing that you will get from this book that you didn't already know. Um, So it's not for smarks? It's absolutely not. I don't really know who this book is aimed for. How Uh, much kayfabe is in? There's like zero kayfabe. Oh, hey, how about that? Practically zero, but it's stuff that you already know. Can you give us the layout of the book? Uh, So this book is set up into two parts both with about 16 to 18 chapters each, a series of backstage chats that the author has with wrestlers, bookers, some of the suits that work in WWE, and of course, the most important one of all, which after reading it turns out to be one of the least important ones, Vince McMahon. Oh my God. Uh, Which is chapter one, uh, which is where I'll kick off. I won't lie. I nearly rage quit this book. Oh no! Halfway through chapter one. So did you, did you read it in Vince McMahon's voice in your head? <laughs> that would have been amazing. No, but I should have. It may have made it slightly more entertaining. Anyway, chapter one is just Vince spouting his Rhet- WWE propaganda. His rhetoric. Yeah. His rhetoric. Buying this company from his dad. It was me against the world. Every other promoter hated me and they ganged up on me but i got the last laugh just like bret hart in his book (laughs) (laughs) needless to say (laughs) i had the last laugh. Uh, he got the last laugh and he took wrestling and this is a line you've probably heard a million times from the bingo halls to the big stadiums and from the you know smoky dusty from the smoky dusty bingo halls to the big international stage and it's like you're just reading this from some kind of press release. WWE press book that you've read a thousand times before. Do you know what else Vince does during this chapter? Um, he accosts Lex Luger. <laughs> uh, he talks about the WWE in 1982. Nice. And yes. the WWE universe in 1983. I nearly rage quit right after those lines. I, I was so <laughs> angry. <laughs> he's backdated his buzzwords. Yes, totally. He's just spouting corporate speak throughout the entire thing. I kind of feel bad for the author then, John Robbins. Like, he's, his name is attached to this book. I mean, like, he doesn't really write anything. You know what I mean? Everything that he types out is just someone else's words and you know he might have a few lines or quips thrown in uh, here and there but mm-hmm. he's probably the least important part of this book uh, which is quite sad for him because I'm sure he put in a lot of work he was at 
practically every show for an entire year. Wow. And he got unprecedented levels of backstage interviews and he was there for some fucking meetings that actually mean things, you know? Like what? Like meetings with the big wigs in WWE setting up where Mania is going to be held. Who are these people? Some like, of the big booking. Uh, they're just the... Like, like do you mean Funley or... No, 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 no. And with the big wigs. George Barrios. Like, yeah, yeah, all of these Yeah, lads, yeah the heads you know? of corporate. Yeah. Like, the, like, like, there are very rarely names mentioned, you know? Like, oh, really? Yeah. In the book. He will talk about your man, John Sapur, the EVP of special events. Okay. Which is actually probably up there with my favorite chapter in this book, where he talks about how WWE travel around and meet with mayors of different cities and towns, and they try to put their own place over to book Mania and actually get it there. And then he goes on to like hot dog and talk about how big having mania is for these cities and how it brings in 181 million dollars 25 million dollars is brought in by by the fans renting rooms 10 million is brought in by fans eating out during wrestlemania week and the other 150 million he doesn't mention. <laughs> I don't know where he's getting this number from. Is this like the affinity people have for WWE? There's 6 billion people with affinity for WWE. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> totally. Totally. So every wrestler gets a different chapter in the book. And we're just going to go through the highlights of it. You know, if a wrestler says anything interesting. All right. Tell me about the modern day Maharaja. The modern day Maharaja. So he talks with the author how he's the hardest working man in wrestling and how when he was re-signed that he wasn't a great worker and he was in terrible shape. But through hard work and dedication and seeing your prayers and taking your vitamins, he's suddenly become the roidiest monster ever <laughs> and has gotten his push and is rightfully on the top of the wrestling world. He puts over the company big saying that, you know, they helped me and if it wasn't for them and if it wasn't for Vince and if it wasn't for Triple H, then I never would have gotten here. He's basically just towing the uh, line. So there's nothing interest of interest? No, there. nothing, nothing. Okay. There is one later chapter where, shockingly, Randy Orton puts over Jinder so much as the hardest working guy in WWE, and he says that how he's turned from a terrible wrestler of a few years ago to a rightful main event. Oh, fuck off. And I'm like, Randy, I watched those matches. They were shit. I will say. They were dirt. <laughs> Randy is a great lad for putting over new champions. You know, yeah. like, he did it with Captain Jack Swagger. Yeah. That's Jack Swagger's champion only pay-per-view win was against Randy Orton. The cover by the champion! Hook to the leg! Jack Swagger is retained! And he did it for the modern day Maharaja. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, good stuff, Randy. Mm. Although, you know, people immediately dismiss that loss, so it's not a big time <laughs> loss, yeah, totally. you know. So most of this book most. is basically just the very same. He talks to different wrestlers at different points throughout the year. And they just put over WWE as being the best place in the world. The to happiest place work, on earth. The happiest place on earth. And they put over WrestleMania as the granddaddy of them all, the biggest show of the year, and every other corporate buzzword that they've come up for Mania throughout the past 35 years. Uh, you learn nothing. They're. <laughs> <laughs> We're promoting this book, right? <laughs> there are a couple of mm. highlights. In particular, I'd say the interviews with The Miz. Awesome. And with Daniel Bryan, where they both just go into business for themselves and don't really talk about the WWE booking. And they just talk about how those two lads going back and forth uh, got their own feud over more than any feud in the company for years <laughs> and then how it wasn't paid off with a match at WrestleMania. <laughs> <laughs> so like that's kind of fun. Yeah. And I'd expect that from Daniel Bryan because he's uh, he doesn't give very a frank. Shit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He doesn't like, give a fire shit. me. I'll I'll work somewhere else. I don't care. I was kind of shocked at how frank and open Miz was. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. It's almost like in Miz's mind he's he's gotten to the point where he can say these things and he's not going to get into shit over it, you know? Which is nice. 
I've already starred in four Marine movies. <laughs> what are you going to do? Hollywood's man? coming knocking. <laughs> Pay me, me and Mark Henry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what about Smoley and Joe? Bollocks. He's nothing to say. I was kind of shocked that Joe, AJ, and Bobby Roode at least mentioned TNA. Oh, wow. They don't talk about it much, and they basically call it a tiny little indie company. Which it is Which now. Is, yeah, it is now, yeah. But when they were there, it was the number two company oh, yeah. in the country, you mm. know? And they just say that even though I was working there, I I was really dreaming about having my match at Mania. <laughs> Despite every time people would ask you that, you said, fuck WWE. <laughs> Absolutely. It's, especially AJ. Yeah. He yeah, yeah, yeah. hated WWE. AJ goes on to mention wrestling Nakamura in Japan. Oh, nice. Um, Amazing match. Way he, better than their WWE match. He says that he had a great match and he would love to wrestle Nakamura at Mania, uh, which they went on to give us. Uh, so that's nice. Um, <laughs> Be careful what you wish for. Yeah, though. yeah. Some of the interviews that I hated... Bobby Roode is probably the worst interview in the entire book. Oh, no. He's just a WWE shill at this point. He just puts it over like, all I ever wanted to do was go to WWE. It's amazing. What a company. It's a juggernaut. This is where memories are made. And I'm just like, he's just spouting corporate bollocks. Then I'd say the second worst interview in the book is Dean Ambrose. Oh, no. He just comes across like an idiot. He has That's shocking. He has nothing to say. He doesn't put over anything. Is he still than, injured at this point or is he back? Actually, I don't think he was injured at this point. The Shield has just gotten back together at this point. Uh, uh, when the book was... Yeah. Okay. And so, the book was released in August, but I'm sure it was finished a couple of months before yeah. that. Yeah. And so he's just putting over Roman Reigns as being the best wrestler in the world and he's the man to take the company forward and the Shield have kicked ass and that the Shield come out every night and they're the most over and they get the biggest pops and I'm just like, you're saying nothing, mate, you know? Like, I'm just wasting my 11 minutes reading this chapter. (laughs) (laughs) My highlight of the entire book, Jay, which is not even a chapter, it is the middle of the book sandwiched in between part one and part two where they talk to about a dozen different wrestlers what's their favorite mania and what's their favorite match at mania it's my favorite part of the entire book because i learned something and the wrestlers weren't spouting corporate shite they were honest they were fans and they came across as real yeah just like jay uso and he talks about wrestlemania 9 so it would have been the head shrinkers versus the steiners Jey Uso says, My dad was on the card against the Steiner brothers, and I remember him saying that his feet were burnt because the mat was so hot from the sun. That's a cool little fact right yeah, there. Yeah, it's, it's nice. You know, it's different. That's hilarious. That, like, you never think about that as, like, a negative of going barefoot wrestling. <laughs> it's hot outside. Yeah. Ooh, hi. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Jimmy Uso, his brother, says, I really enjoyed when Yoko beat Brett for the title, but then Hogan came out and beat him for the title. I also loved when my uncle Umaga had the hair versus hair match against Bobby Lashley. That's WrestleMania 23. You go back and watch that one. It's one hell of a match. That's because Umaga was awesome. He was amazing. Do you remember his I Quit match with John Cena? Oh, it's brilliant. Holy shit, that put over Cena so much. One of Cena's best ever matches. Man, Umaga does not have bad matches. No, he was Great so worker, talented. Yeah. I was like, I'd be happy with you being champion. Yeah. Yeah, you were yeah. awesome. Like, it's an acronym because, like, 2007, you have the Savage gimmick, but he's fucking great. Yeah. Yes. So, um, most of the... Most. Most of the interviews in this book are fluff, but there's one last chapter that I do want to talk about. All and, right. And it's Road Dog, okay? <gasps> Two real G's. Oh, you didn't know. Road Dog talks about getting hired as an agent, working there for a few months before getting a chance to move up to creative and then slowly move up to the head of creative on SmackDown. Even though he is the top dog, <laughs> the road dog. very much yeah. intended on the blue brand, he literally has no actual power <laughs> because it's Vince's show and Vince can and does change something on a daily basis as a match is happening and that they literally don't know what's really going on all until Vince lets them all in. But there was one... What an insane way to run a company. It's madness. Absolute chaos. I'd probably do the exact same thing. <laughs> 
but there was one part that stuck out to me so much and it just kind of burned into my brain the hatred they have for their most loyal fans. Road Dog goes on a oh, big... Oh, he tweets about this sometimes, doesn't he? He does. And so Road Dog goes on a rant about how much he resents the hardcore fan. They moan when we push this guy and then they'll moan if we don't push the same guy and they'll moan about this match finish and they'll moan about this feud... And then he says, the big thing that people were moaning about going into WrestleMania this year is, oh, you have John Cena versus Taker. You have Ronda Rousey against Triple H and his wife. But what about us, the hardcore fans? We want Nakamura versus AJ. And he just goes on to say, yeah, well, you've got it. And so fuck you. And you still moan. <laughs> and it's like, of course they did, James. Because they saw how you booked the feud and how (laughs) shit it was. Like, just putting a match on Mania and going, there you go, you cunts. That'll tie us over for the next year. That's not how it works. (laughs) It's a weekly show. You have to give them something. And you can just tell from how he talks. He just, he hates them. And that's something that permeated this entire book. And it's a bit sad. (laughs) It's a bit fucking sad. Yeah, because, geez, without the hardcore fans, you're left in the new gen era, you know, where wrestling is in the toilet and no one has any jobs. Like, they're the most loyal fans that spend the most money. Yeah. And you're getting direct feedback as well. You're saying, you know, fans have a moan. You're also saying that Vince changes it during the match, you know, during the day. So there's no great storytelling that can be told. That can be at at all. There's no long-term booking, is what you're saying. So... They're right to. And <laughs> these are your meal ticket, mate. So shut These up. are the people <laughs> who buy your merch. These are the people who buy the belts. Yeah. Anyway, uh, so reasons why you would read this book, Stephen. It's given to you. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway, thank you so much. Wow, great job with the review, mate. Um, really enjoyed that. Oh, so we actually got sent a couple of extra copies from EC- ECW oh Press. Oh my god. So what we're going to do is we'll have a Photoshop contest, right? So everyone can enter. Um, I'll put up a picture of the billboard that we have at the start of the OSW episodes. And you Photoshop in funny billboard gag, something to do with wrestling and OSW specifically that our fans will get. And if you're one of the top seven, we'll send you a signed copy of WWE Creating the Mania. Nice. A nice, um, well, it's too big for a stocking. Uh, and a cargo pants, I don't know. <laughs> well, you could bludgeon someone with it. Yeah, yeah, we yeah, yeah, could be one of the bludgeon brothers. <sighs> Boom. Uh, oh, yeah. Hopefully not, actually. <laughs> Aim it a little higher, mate. <laughs> So that will do it for this episode of OSW Playlist for November 2018. I really hope you enjoyed it. Steve, thank you so much for being on board, mate. Uh, Cheers for having me. It was nice to get this off my chest. (laughs) Rock and roll. (laughs) So if you have any thoughts, feelings or comments about WWE creating the Mania book or Faith, that's the indie game from uh, MS-DOS ZX Spectrum. (laughs) It's awesome. Go play it. It's free. Leave a comment below. Let us know about it. Wow. Next time we'll see you is early, in the future. 2019 for our December 2018 uh, OSW playlist. So it's a goodbye from V1. Take a boo. And myself, Jay Hunter. And remember, a winner is you. <laughs> <laughs>